You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the Rand Corporation. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from Rand's latest research and commentary. It's May 22nd. States are beginning to ease the social distancing restrictions put in place to combat the spread of COVID-19. So what might happen next? A couple of weeks ago, we discussed a new RAND tool that was developed to provide insights into that question. It uses health and economic modeling to estimate the consequences of rolling back or maintaining social distancing and other disease-fighting measures. Our researchers are updating the tool regularly with new data to help state decision makers make evidence-based decisions about whether, when, and how to reopen. To illustrate a key takeaway from the tool, let's look at our latest projections for two states, Texas and Wisconsin. Texas plans to relax its relatively loose restrictions soon. Our researchers estimate that if Texas begins to relax restrictions in June, then cumulative deaths in the state will reach 58,000 by September 1st, while the economic losses will total $19.2 billion. If Texas were instead to leave these restrictions in place until August, then there would be an estimated 16,000 cumulative deaths, while economic losses would total $26.4 billion. Now let's look at Wisconsin, where the situation is in flux after the state's Supreme Court overturned the governor's stay-at-home order. According to our estimates, if Wisconsin had started to relax its restrictions about a week ago in mid-May, then cumulative deaths would reach 9,300 by September 1st. Economic losses would total $6.1 billion. And if Wisconsin were to leave restrictions in place until mid-July, then cumulative deaths would be an estimated 1,500, while economic losses would total $7.9 billion. For both states, the trade-offs are similar. Having more restrictions in place for longer periods leads to fewer deaths at an economic cost. That strategy also pushes the problem into the future. In other words, maintaining social distancing buys states time. Rand experts say that extra time may be crucial because states can use it to improve the ability of communities to interact safely. For example, by producing and distributing personal protective equipment or by redesigning workspaces to allow people to keep their distance. This time could also be used to push forward with expanded testing, improved treatments, and vaccine development. If you're interested in exploring the scenarios for your own state, you can access the tool for free at RAND.org. Polling suggests that views about the pandemic and how the U.S. should respond to it are largely partisan. In an interview with Vox last week, RAND's Jennifer Cavanaugh explained how truth decay the diminishing role of facts in American public life, is contributing to this political divide. She sums it up by saying, quote, People are not sure what's true, what's not, and they don't even really know where to turn to find the factual information they're looking for. There are some other forces at play, too, she says. First, the ability to access any information online makes people feel empowered and can lead to overconfidence about the accuracy of the information they consume. Second, most people like to confirm their own beliefs. This leads people to reject information that doesn't fit that pre-existing narrative, even if it comes from an expert or reliable source. Kavanaugh goes on to discuss how the truth decay phenomenon could hinder the U.S. COVID-19 response. What's worrying, she says, is that as we transition into a recovery phase, the public's trust has likely already been lost. That trust has to be rebuilt. But could there eventually be a silver lining? Could COVID-19 be the big jolt that finally convinces Americans of the importance of objective facts? While we certainly aren't seeing that just yet, it's possible. Maybe we need to be on the other side of this and look back on what happened, says Kavanaugh. I don't know what it will take, but I'm not willing to give up yet. The dilapidated state of America's physical infrastructure, its roads, bridges, and waterways, has been widely reported. 
But according to Rand's James Riseff, there's another type of U.S. infrastructure that needs updating, digital infrastructure. More specifically, the software systems that local, state, and federal government agencies have invested in are in urgent need of repair, he says. And their shortcomings have been highlighted by the coronavirus crisis. For example, some states' unemployment insurance websites have crashed under increasing strain, delaying the unemployment claims of millions of Americans. But even before the pandemic, there were failures, such as the 2018 collapse of the Veterans Administration IT systems used to pay out GI Bill benefits. So what could be done to fix these systems and prevent future problems? RISEF lays out three best practices that the government could follow. First, it's important to think of software as a set of platforms to build on, instead of isolated applications that accomplish single tasks in a single way. The siloed approach, which is largely the makeup of government systems today, means that data gets trapped inside individual applications, where it can't easily be shared or reused in an emergency for a new purpose. Second, it's important to fund software applications for their complete life cycle. Too often, government agencies resource software projects the same way they fund other purchases, with a significant upfront investment and then greatly reduced appropriations to maintain it over time. However, software projects continuously evolve as the data they ingest change, and users discover new things they need the software to do and errors and omissions in the original design may crop up. That's why continued funding is important. It can account for these kinds of changes. And finally, RISEF says that government officials should consider ways to make software more resilient. This may mean minimizing the number of nice-to-have features in applications, which can quickly lead to cost overruns and incorrect implementations. Legislators will likely have to rely on experts in understanding the trade-offs of software implementation. But following these principles could breathe new life into the country's crumbling digital infrastructure. We've covered the issues with government software applications, but there are also pandemic-related concerns about the software that's running all the time in our pockets. Cell phones, activity trackers, and other smart devices offer an unprecedented opportunity to identify, track, map, and communicate about COVID-19. In some cases, they're already being used for contact tracing. While it makes sense to use these technologies to help fight the spread of infections and keep individuals and communities informed, there are important security and privacy trade-offs to consider. Rand experts say that there is limited ability to conduct oversight on how apps on our phones are used, and how any results or data that they provide are being interpreted. To conduct contact tracing effectively, there must be a high rate of accurate testing accompanied by clear guidance about what to do if a person has come into contact with someone who's infected. Without these pillars in place, using devices to track cases won't be beneficial. Second, Privacy protection is somewhat limited and variable across apps. Although many users may be willing to suspend privacy protections in the face of the pandemic, there are unanswered questions about whether and how personal data could continue to be used in the future. And finally, there are cybersecurity risks. The same digital applications that can help treat and track COVID-19 could also introduce vulnerabilities that bad actors could take advantage of now or in the future, to conduct a range of attacks and surveillance. Taking reasonable precautions against these risks, in addition to preventing the spread of the virus, can help keep communities safe and well during this emergency. During the pandemic, many psychiatrists have rapidly transitioned to provide consultations via phone and video. To learn more about this shift and how it's affected care, RAND researchers conducted a series of interviews. The findings highlight some concerns from psychiatrists, including decreased clinical data available for assessments, diminished privacy for patients, and increased distractions in the home setting. For example, one interviewee said that some patients struggle to focus and be present. That may be because they're trying to multitask at home 
or because they're not really comfortable with talking over the phone or using video chat. Also important, some psychiatrists pointed out that their disadvantaged patients lack reliable access to a smartphone, computer, or the internet. Nonetheless, the majority of interviewees said that given these unprecedented circumstances, the transition to telemedicine in the early weeks of the pandemic went more smoothly than they had expected. And most psychiatrists view the experience as largely positive for both patients and physicians. Here's how one individual put it. I'm actually stunned at how amazingly well it's gone. It has surprised me that I've been able to feel as connected as I have with patients on video. Having already escaped conflict and persecution, the world's 71 million refugees, internally displaced persons, and asylum seekers now face risk of illness and death from the coronavirus. According to Rand's Shelley Culbertson and former advisor to President George W. Bush, Gary Edson, this crisis could be an opportunity to remake the broken system that's designed to support displaced people. What's needed, they say, is a new framework for helping refugees and host countries, both during and after the pandemic, that reflects the different circumstances of refugees living both in camps and in urban areas. Reforms could focus on providing more financial and technical assistance directly to host governments, which are the main source of both employment and health care for most refugees. Additionally, funding for the World Food Program could provide more food assistance to refugees who are unable to work. And finally, to ensure that refugees have access to a COVID-19 vaccine once it becomes available, the Global Vaccine Alliance could ensure that eligible countries, the world's poorest nations, include refugees in their requests. Changes like these could help ensure that the post-pandemic world isn't one characterized by swelling refugee camps, and instead is one that provides equitable access to work, health care, and a social safety net. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis. For more on what we covered this week, check the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We're off next week, but you can find us back in your feed on June 5th. See you then.